welcome to our live virtual workshop for urban gardening, gardening and sustainability. My name is Amanda Poss. I'm the gallery director at Gallery 221 at HCC Dale Mabry campus. And I'm also um, privileged to be the committee chair for Grounds for Art at HCC, which oversees all of our public art initiatives, including NEST. I'm thrilled to have you all here with us. Um, this is the second installment in our event series about our new public art project, NEST, which stands for Nourishment, Education, and Social Terraces. And this will be completed on two campus locations, one which you can see behind me at the HCC Dale Mabry campus and the other at the HCC Ybor City campus, both in the spring of 2021. Um, I'm so especially glad that you all are here because your participation and your comments and your questions and your feedback for the all of our events this fall mm -hmm. are crucial to the project and they're going to inform our artist Tori Tepp as he creates his design for both spaces. So a little bit about these Zoom meetings. Uh, we are recording this event, as you might have noticed, and we will work to make it available online through our YouTube channel. If you want to be notified when that's available, simply subscribe Gallery 221 HCC. You may have also noticed that all of our audience members tonight are muted. However, this doesn't mean we don't want to hear from you, rather quite the opposite. So we welcome your participation in the chat section at any point during the event. If you have a comment, you just want to say hello, um, and especially if you have questions, please go ahead and throw it in there. Um, and we'll be keeping an eye on those as we go through the event tonight. So here's how the event will proceed. First, you're going to hear a few words of welcome from the HCC Ybor City Campus President, Dr. Ginger Clark. Next, I'll say a few thank yous uh, to our event sponsors and supporters. After that, I'll introduce our artist, Tori Tepp, who will talk a little bit more about NEST, and then I'll introduce Paul Rabau, who will lead the planting demo. And that's when you'll need um, your soil and your pot and your herb seeds ready to go. While you're finishing up planting and getting all settled in, Paul and Tori and I are going to have a conversation about all, how all this relates to sustainability and also to the NEST project. And then last, but certainly not least, uh, since we're planting herbs and talking about food, Kelsey Morgan, who's our HCC Food Security Coordinator, will talk about the resources that the college is offering to address food insecurity now. So, Without any further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Ginger Clark, the campus president for HCC Ybor City. So Dr. Clark, please go ahead and unmute and, and say a few words of welcome. Sure, thank you, Amanda. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we've been looking forward to uh, this, this day because it gives us a chance to share with you all some of the great work that's going on on the Ybor City campus. Much of the work that we're doing right now really stems from our identity as a campus that sits at the intersection of this beloved historic district and this now thriving downtown corridor. And obviously all of that is wrapped up into this larger uh, urban ecosystem. And so if I take a look at all of that and think about the work that we're doing, which I was just looking at this uh, yesterday, I think it really falls into sort of three broad categories. Um, first, we're really working hard to soften the hardscapes around the campus. Um, right now, we have a plaza area that everyone enjoys. Um, well, pre-COVID, everyone enjoyed gathering there. You would always see lots of students out in that space, but that was really the only space on campus that we really had to, to gather. And so I think the NEST project and other work we're doing will really soften those hardscapes for us. We want students to come to our campus and to stay on the campus. And I think those green spaces and the use of public art uh, will help us achieve that goal. I think that's particularly critical for students on urban campuses. Um, second of all, we're looking to um, restore our sense of connectivity to the natural environment. I think when you are in these urban environments, you just really lose track uh, of nature. And um, I think the pandemic has particularly brought this home to us about how disconnected we are and how we all crave this now. Um, I was looking the other day at just the increase in bike sales recently. 
Uh, that to me just says people are eager to get outside and to experience nature. So we're working hard to redraw and uh, redesign those connections. And then lastly, um, I would say that as an urban campus, we have our set of challenges around issues pertaining to food uh, and water and agriculture in general. But at the same time, I think what we can do as a campus is to demonstrate how urban environments can actually provide leadership uh, for these issues, particularly through some of the work that Professor Rabo is doing on the campus. I think who are helping students especially begin to see how to connect uh, those dots uh, between uh, food challenges, water challenges, and agricultural challenges. So um, I would probably leave it there, Amanda. Hopefully that provides a, a good context for the discussion that's going to occur today. Uh, but certainly I would be happy to entertain any questions if there's time later on. So thank you all. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Clark, for giving um, our audience, especially this kind of broad view of how this is going to work uh, for the campuses and, and, and be something that is so needed and, and supportive for our community. And for all those people who are coming to our campuses um, who may be not a part of the HCC family yet. Um, at this point now, I would like to, before I introduce Tori and Paul, do my few words of thanks. So I have quite a few folks that I need to recognize for their support of this project. So as you see here, first I want to express my gratitude to all of our NEST sponsors, the Gobia Foundation, the HCC Foundation, Stan Store, Embrace the Arts Foundation, and SGA, and also our community partners, the Arts Council, the TVBCA, Tempest Projects, Feeding Tampa Bay, and Rooted Resistance. Um, their sponsorship, commitment, and financial support is what makes this project possible. My thanks also goes out to our college administration for their support. We can't do this without that. Uh, so thank you so much to our HCC campus presidents, um, Dr. Ginger Clark from Ebor, who you just heard from, but also Dr. Ellen Witt from the Dale Mabry campus, as well as our two art deans from each of those campuses, Amy Bousquet and Dr. Keith Berry. I'm also very especially grateful for my gallery team, Emiliano Sedicasi, Mark Miller. We also have a special volunteer today, Aurora, helping us out. Um, they helped us put this together, working behind the scenes. Um, and as well as my extensive NEST steering committee, which is made up of HCC faculty, staff, students, and local community partners. I, I can't say thank you enough to each one of those people. Um, and, Finally, my sincere appreciation to all of our speakers, Tori, Paul, and, and Kelsey Morgan, who you'll hear from at the end. Thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us. So now as we look forward to getting started into the conversation, just a quick reminder to our audience that our session tonight will end with some Q&A. Um, so remember, you can put in your comments, your inquiries into the chat at any time as we go forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce Tori Tepp. So Tori, I'm gonna read a little bit about you, so go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, Tori received his undergraduate BFA in painting from Parsons, the new school for design in New York City, and an MFA in 2009 in public practice as part of the inaugural class of Susan Lacey's public practice program at Otis College of Art and Design in Los Angeles. Here he developed his practice around exploration and reestablishment of the metaphysical connections between the social and environmental ecologies that shape urban communities. Tori has completed projects all over the US, including New Orleans, Milwaukee, Los Angeles, Death Valley, the High Sierra Mountains, New Smyrna Beach, Tampa, and recently um, it, in Wisconsin. So Tori, um, thank you for being here with us. And, and I'd like to invite you at this point to talk a little bit more about your work and your participation in the project. Great, well, thank you for having me and hello to everybody. Uh, good morning, welcome to the talk. Um, <clears throat> I'm very excited to be working with all of you down there at, at the, um, at the two NEST sites. It's, we, we get to do two projects really, so it's just kind of exciting. Um, how I kind of got involved in this, in case you missed the, the last talk, uh, really does kind of go back to this issue of sustain sustainability where um, I, I literally started growing vegetables and produce out of my recycled art project. So 
it was the first time I was doing earthworks. I used the soil and put it into gardens and grew food. Um, and it was kind of a revelation to me, not only in the fact that I was sustaining myself nutritionally, but um, it also allowed me to start having a dialogue with my community um, because there's, there's something that's so global and ubiquitous about growing food. It, it, culturally, everybody can find a way to talk about it or, or is curious about it. So um, growing these gardens out on the street in Los Angeles allowed me to, to also start having a dialogue with my community. Um, so with public art especially, you know, it has a power to really promote ideas in a way that um, some other mediums can't. That's why right now there's so, so much cross disciplinary work going on between arts and sciences because, you know, it's, it's of utmost important to start getting some of these messages out there, these environmental messages, especially around climate crisis. And so art is, allows us to sort of translate some of the data and some of the information and make it accessible or um, interesting in a way that gets people involved. Um, so here in Tampa at the at HCC, what is exciting to me is that I, I like to kind of consider myself a, a sort of a stage builder. And so these talks are, are a way for me and all of you to start having a conversation so that I can maybe start understanding what what kind of stage to build and then it allows you you all to have a place within which to create a script and and have your own dialogue or you know have your own play um, so what i'd really like to facilitate here at both of these campuses is a a project that is not as just a static piece of art but a project that is part of an ongoing dialogue with everybody at the, at the campus and the student body the faculty um, visitors from the community and um, <clears throat> I think it could be very interesting to, um, you know, shape this space so that <laughs> once COVID goes away, the, the project itself, instead of just being a, a monument or a sculpture, um, becomes a, a usable public space that um, hopefully can be enjoyed and continues to grow and, and change, evolve uh, over the years as the project is there. So, um, I think this conversation that we're all about to have is very important to, in a way that the project can reach out and engage with the HCC community in a variety of ways that that still keeps it vital and maybe um, connects to many other different sustainable options that are there at, at the, uh, you know, the, for example, the bees or pollinators or composting or, or any way that this can continue to, to just engage with the student body um, over the years. Uh, I mean, I think that's really what we're what we're going for with Nest. So thank you so much, Tori. I, I love what you're talking about how this can promote ideas and connect to all of the other really interesting and vital services that HCC is already providing. Um, and you're going to hear a little bit about someone who's involved with that, Paul, in just a bit. Um, so you can learn more about what HCC is doing and, and how we work to support our community and you know, grow and evolve. I mean, I love, we always talk about things growing, right, in this abstract way, but with Nest, the lovely thing is you get to see it literally happening. So it's a green space that will, will grow and mature over time. Um, so uh, I want to remind everyone to have their supplies ready in just a bit because I am now going to introduce uh, Paul who's going to do our live demonstration. So before we dig in and start planting, um, I'd like to say a few words about Paul Robau. So Paul received his MS from the University of South Florida in molecular biology and cell science in 2013. And he's currently an assistant professor of biology and sustainability coordinator at HCC. Paul has led multiple educational sustainability initiatives at the college, such as the bee farm at the HCC Ybor City campus. A self-proclaimed maggot farmer, he has dedicated himself to scientific literacy and educating his community about environmental issues while limiting his own ecological footprint in the process. So Paul, it's my pleasure to have you here. I can go ahead and unmute and, and let's, let's dig in. All right, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, All right. sounds good. All right, nice. Okay, cool. So hey everybody, my name is Paul and I am the HEC Sustainability Coordinator as well as I happen to teach a few classes around the campus. Um, I'm located at the Ybor campus and we do have an apiary, which is a bee farm on the roof of the student services building. 
and potentially minus COVID, we offer live tours so you can come up and check out the bees. Um, all right, so let's say we get, we get cracking into the dirt here. What we're gonna be doing today is sort of breaking down the barriers for getting you guys growing something. Um, <clears throat> so before we do that, I thought I would tell you a real quick story about two plants. All right, so I'm gonna move the, there we go. All right, so I got my, these two plants right here. And uh, this is some pretty cool new research that's out that once uh, uh, there's some like some interesting chemistry that's happening. Um, if you have two plants like this, like I have two little basil plants here and, and some water, and there was a caterpillar chewing on one of these, these plants. And what happened is as it was chewing on this plant, uh, this plant over here really started to produce all sorts of chemicals that makes the basil taste really terrible. Okay, so basically like don't eat me type of chemicals. But what was really fascinating and really making scientists scratch their head is that a neighboring plant over here also started to produce those chemicals, which is weird, right? Because the plants were somehow communicating. Um, so what the scientists did is they, they basically put some plastic netting, like plastic bags over these two plants and they put caterpillars in one and not in the other because they thought maybe something through the air was moving across the two plants and the plastic would keep all the caterpillar parts over here and not over here. But still, when this one was getting chomped by caterpillars, this one over here started to release those chemicals. And that was pretty crazy. So of course, the scientists thought, ah, of course the roots, right? The roots underground were somehow communicating between the two plants. So the plants were actually far enough apart that the roots never interacted and chemicals weren't moving through the soil. What was happening was each of the plants were infected by fungus. And fungus is sort of like a cotton candy type of tubing that had actually infected the roots of this one and this one. And they were actually sharing information back and forth. The plants were literally talking to each other. So when this one got sick, it told the other one over here, hey, watch out, caterpillars are on the prowl. Super fascinating. And it just sort of makes me wonder about all the cool stuff that we don't know that's happening underground. And so what we're gonna do today is kind of get our fingers into that unknown and get some dirt underneath the, those fingers. Okay, so hopefully you guys have a few supplies. You need nothing expensive to, to get going into this. Um, you need to have uh, an, you know, some sort of container. I'm gonna be using an old egg carton, um, so a plastic one, but you can also be using a, uh, a paper one that would work just fine. And you also need some kind of dirt. I dug this up from my yard and I put it into my kid's uh, bucket right here. And I'm outside because it's beautiful outside right now. So, um, so I, you know, encourage you to maybe if you're mobile, get outside and enjoy some of this, some of this really nice sunshine. Okay, so this is what we're going to be doing. Oh yeah, and also you need uh, some seeds. And just like, how amazing are these seeds that um, are basically inert little pebbles, and then they magically are going to come to life on your kitchen table. Okay, so let's get, get started. I'm gonna move the camera down here so you can see what my fingers are up to. <clears throat> okay, so I have myself a regular egg carton. It's got two uh, places for the eggs right here and it's got some sort of a, uh, I don't know, some sort of a dish we're gonna use it as at the top. And I have some, some scissors and I'm just going to simply cut the top of this dish off. <clears throat> and then I'm going to keep this one. This is the solid piece for later. I'm just going to set this aside over here. So now I have this, uh, this sort of the egg part of the egg carton. And I'm going to only use today just one half of this. So I'm going to cut this right down the middle as well. Super easy. In fact, it kind of breaks apart once you, uh, once you kind of get it going. I'm gonna break this guy. And remember, you don't have to use an egg carton. I just am because I had one had one lying around. So this is what it looks like. It's just a, a nice little piece of, uh, of tray with some, some nice little dimples in here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my dirt. So I have some, um, 
uh, some compost that I, I dug up from my, from my garden. And what's so cool about compost is it's not just a bunch of uh, stuff for plants. I mean, it is, but it's also a living tapestry with all of that fungus we were talking about, microbes that are in here chewing on plant products. There's all sorts of good stuff in here. And in Florida, we basically live on a giant sandbar. So there's not all this good stuff. And so uh, we can talk about a little bit later how you can make really good compost at home to help your plants uh, grow really nicely. Because just sand isn't really going to cut it. It's pretty, it's, you know, they're not going to grow as well. That's why I don't see too many plants at the beach. All right, so let's take some of this dirt. Let's get, uh, get dirty <clears throat> and just sort of start sprinkling it into uh, your little little pockets right here where the eggs would usually sit. So I usually give it a nice little little sprinkle all the way across. And you can't really mess this up. You know, and also like I usually do this with my with my kids. And if you have kids at home, this is a great thing to do because kids love playing in the dirt. So you can bring your kids into the fray, you know, you can get them interested in gardening. And the best way to get kids to eat their vegetables is to have kids grow their vegetables. It really provides that connection uh, to the earth and these earth systems that Dr. Clark was talking about. If you can instill that really early in your kids, they'll carry that with them their entire life. All right, so I'm kind of just packing down that, that soil into where the eggs would typically go. And once I get it down, you know, pretty good, can't really mess this up. I'm going to go ahead and set this soil aside over here. And what I've done is kind of created a nice little little mat where now I can make some dimples with my fingers. I'm going to place my seeds in there. So I just kind of make a nice little dimple. And the rule of thumb for planting seeds, roughly, remember this is not exactly <laughs> a, it's more of an art than a science on this one. It's, it's roughly twice whatever the seed width is. So if you have some really small seeds, like some of those basil seeds, uh, you don't need to plant them very deep. Now, I, I got some pretty large seeds because of this demo. I wanted to make sure you guys can see them. These are sugar snap peas. One of my favorite things to grow because they are just one of those garden treats that never quite make it back into the house. Uh, you just eat them when you're outside. So I'm going to plant some sugar snap peas. So you can see these little tiny marble looking things. And I drop one into each one of those little divots that I make with my fingers. So you just need one <clears throat> and then plop them on down. And again, how cool that these little things, these little, little marble things are gonna turn into a plant as soon as you add the right conditions. So I'm gonna take the seeds that I didn't use and just stick them right back in the envelope and use them for later. And I'm gonna go back to my, my soil mixture here. And I'm just gonna drop some soil loosely on the top of each one of these seeds. And then I'm gonna drop, all right, just a little bit of soil, just so they're kind of covered up. And then I'm gonna come back and just lightly press that soil back on top. And what that's gonna do is provide a little bit of pressure. So when the seed starts to push a root down into the dirt, there's something to kind of push against and get those roots down deep. So at the end, your, <clears throat> your sort of a soil area here with the seeds should be mostly covered up. And now you can add a little bit of water. So what I have is some water standing by right here. And I just put a little bit of water on each one because we're actually gonna water this from the bottom up. And I'll show you how that works in a, in a second. What this is gonna do is just sort of wet the seeds a little bit and get them nicely contacting the soil. And then what I have is oops, a small, I have a small pin, just a small nail, and I'm gonna prick the bottoms of each one of these little, little egg dimples. I'm not sure what you call these really. So each one of these little pockets where an egg would typically go. Now, if you're using a paper one, you do not need to do this. But since I'm using a plastic one, we want to make sure that the water doesn't fill up this whole tray. And then you kind of create a bit of a quagmire. Everything starts to break down. You don't really want to do that. You want it to be moist, but not a soup, if you will. 
Okay, and now we're gonna go back to that tray that we set aside, this sort of solid tray. And mine has a bit of paper in here, so I'm just gonna pluck this right out. And it comes out pretty easy. There's a little bit of glue. I'm gonna pull this out. <clears throat> and set that aside. Now I have this nice clear plastic tray. And remember I have pinholes in the bottom of this. So I can now set this right inside this tray and I have a watertight little tray. And what I can do is add some water to this tray, just like so, just a little bit. And now all of those little, little egg pockets there are kind of sitting in a little bit of water. And what this is gonna do is gently water the, the little egg pockets from below. And that's gonna add the right amount of water to the soil. And you can water it maybe once a day and not have to worry about your little plant babies uh, getting too thirsty. And then all you have to do is just set this near a windowsill and these will start to shoot up in a surprising amount of time. It really depends on uh, what what herbs you're using or what plants you're planting. But in general, they're gonna be coming up within a week or so. So speak to that, I actually set one up about a week ago and this is what I got. So these are sugar snap peas, these, these tendril looking things here. So you can see that that's about maybe six inches or so. And these are planted a week ago. So they've come up this much um, in about a week or so. And then I also have some, some broccolis over here and this one I did with paper. And because I, I use paper, I have a little, uh, this is just one of my plates. And then I just put my little paper egg tray uh, on that. And then I water it uh, right on top of this, uh, uh, this, this plate here. And my daughter and I made this one. And so she's deeply invested in how these plates are gonna go. And what you can do with this is you can take your, your scissors and then you can just snip off uh, a little bit of, I'll kind of show you. Uh, you can just snip off one of these little plant pockets or just rip it off and then boom you got this you know individual little plant baby so let's say you want to put it into an area in your garden you can just dig a little hole and then drop this right in now if the roots have assimilated into the paper this one hasn't but you can see all the root structure down there um, so you got all this growth on the top and then you have all these roots on the bottom and these are just aching to go into the dirt so if they've already assimilated themselves into the paper, don't worry about it and just plant the paper as well. Otherwise, if they haven't, like mine, uh, you can just take this away and then plant this structure right in there. And then you're gonna have some food coming up in about uh, probably like four to six weeks or so, which is, which is awesome, right? So growing your own food is like growing your own money, right? <laughs> and, then, uh, uh, and you can actually get better nutritional quality out of your food that way too. Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, whether about planting or sustainability projects at the college, you can reach me at sustainability at hecfl.edu. And I'd be happy to answer any more of your questions that you have. And if you have any questions for right now, you can leave them in the chat and I'd be happy to do it at the end. Thanks. Yeah, actually, hey, Paul, while, while you're yeah. still fingers in the dirt there, we have a couple yeah. people who are super curious about the compost. Um, so Eric Fisk and also Danny uh, asked about how you do this. So Eric asked, if we don't have compost or soil in our yards, would buying soil at Lowe's or Home Depot be okay? If so what kind for these herbs? Um, but otherwise, too, how would, you, how would you make compost at your house? <laughs> um, I, you know, I really love the idea. Compost to me is like the the uh, the epitome of upcycling, if you will, or recycling. Um, you take stuff that nobody wants anymore. So you're talking banana peels and cores and pits and all that stuff. So um, I take all that food waste and I basically mix it in with mulch. Um, you know, if you talk to any of your local arborists or people cutting trees, they actually have to pay to drop that stuff off at a landfill. So if you talk to them and you say, hey, listen, you know, why don't you drop off that truckload of mulch um, you know, over here in my driveway, you can actually use that mulch and create your own compost with your food scraps. So you can actually take this, uh, this waste product that people would pay to get rid of and turn it into a really valuable product, especially here in Florida. So you can take your food waste and tree waste, mix those two together, and you have something that people will pay for. Um, I compost a little bit differently. I compost with chickens and I can show you guys how I do that. 
uh, since I am outside, it's like right over here. So instead Let's of me it. turning, you want to see it now? <laughs> yeah. I can, I can flip it around. Okay. So <clears throat> excuse me while I, I walk over there. I'll show you my, my compost pile. Um, let me flip this around. Okay. So I'll take you over here. So you can see this is actually, I had some mulch dropped. <laughs> so that's roughly what it looks like. We got quite the operation going on right now. Right, here's my compost pile. Um, so it just looks like a chicken coop because it is. And then <laughs> here's all my compost. I know that one of the problems with uh, with composting is people uh, people really want to try or people need to be able to maintain their compost piles. Um, you know, they don't want to have to go out there and pitchfork and turn them. My solution is just to have animals do it. And so I just use chickens that turn my piles for me. And then they take food scraps, move them underground pretty much and move, you know, fresh mulch on top. And then they basically do all the work. So it works out pretty well. That's so cool. Your video is back too. Oh, good. Okay. Back in Wi-Fi range. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and we've got another question from Ken Hanks. Well, oh, just want to let you know, Ken, we'll, we'll get to that in the Q&A. Um, so please, as you guys have heard things going through, make sure you're putting your questions into the chat. Um, so now that we've planted some seeds and talked a little bit about compost, uh, I'd like to begin sort of our, our broader discussion for, for you and for Tori. So you can both um, go ahead and unmute whenever you want. So let's talk about sustainability and, and why we chose to do this kind of active demonstration with herbs, which is something you can eat, right, as a way to introduce some of the central topics for nest. Um, because people might be thinking public art, science, plants, how, how does this all come together? So uh, let's begin by talking about what sustainability is though first, because that's going to be an important part of our conversation. So, so how do you each define it or how do we do you think that this is defined generally for, for people? And how does that relate to our daily lives? You know, what does it mean to be sustainable? I could go first if you want. Um, the, I, I, my, my definition is I try to live a life that actually adds opportunities to the future, um, then subtracting opportunities to the future. I, I think of it, in that sort of broadest sense, just opportunities, because to me, sustainability isn't just about uh, environmental resources, but also, you know, maybe social resources or cultural resources, economic resources. It's like all of those things. So, you know, how can we build a life that actually increases opportunities for people in the future? So I, I think that like kind of stemming from maybe generational empathy, that idea that when you look out into the world, do you want there to be more things for future generations to be able to see, do, use, whatever? Um, or do you want there to be less things? And I come from an approach that there should be more, you know? So, uh, and like, I also think that our, you know, environmental systems are actually built to provide that if we kind of leave them alone, <laughs> you know, in some ways. Like I, I worked in fisheries for a while and fish produced tons of baby fish if you'd stop catching them just for a little while, right? Or at least you manage them. So I think of that the same way in our forestries, in our water supply, in, in all of those systems that I think that if we just manage them in a, in a way that, that thinks about the future in a, in a better place, uh, you know, it makes, it makes every, everything better, honestly. Yeah. I, um, I've, I've kind of come to a point with this, where I think about, especially with my art practice and the materials that I use, um, I kind of like to think about it like uh, in an ecological sense where, you know, ecology is the relationship between an organism and its environment and other organisms. And <clears throat> so for me, sustainability kind of, I, I've, linking it, liken it to connections or creating connections between yourself and your environment. Um, where the more connections you create, it's just, it's just like with people, the more friends you have, the more family members, like it brings more understanding to your life, more richness, um, more meaning. And uh, 
you know, say sustainability is a, is a process by which we kind of keep creating more of these connections, you know, connections to how we gr grow our food or, or make soil, um, you know, the kind of um, things we use in our art practice, you know, whether these things are toxic for our body, whether they're toxic to the people who have to make them, whether they uh, go into a landfill afterwards, or, you know, it's every one of these connections just adds a much more sort of, uh, richer layer to this whole tapestry that we operate in both socially and economically, uh, environmentally. And, um, you know, the, it's just like Paul said, the more connections you have, sort of the more, it's like the more light bulbs that, that go on. And then the more, um, you know, that like, like this web that all the neurons just start firing as opposed to just having, you know, I go to the store and I buy something and, there's, you know, a million different things that are happening be behind that transaction, you know, right down to like, well, how are the people treated who, who make this or are people getting sick making your iPhone or, you know, um, so in one way it's about expanding these connections, but, but it, to me, there's also more of a simplicity about it. It's like the, the less you need, right? It's like, it kind of cuts down on being a consumer and you become more of a, you become more fluid within the exchange of energies and um, and materials and resources instead of just, you know, every time you need something, you go to the store and, and buy it. And I find that especially interesting in, in terms of art materials. And it's a whole set of problems unto itself. It's like, how can we build something with things that are right here, right? With, with what's right in front of us or with things that are getting discarded or, um, you know, making things out of stuff that's just sort of passing through our life or being being wasted or discarded um or just part of the landscape so that's uh, i love that you guys have these these really broad ideas for sustainability too um that it adds opportunities paul as you mentioned for the future and tori creating connections that brings greater meaning and richness i think that's a really lovely way to think about sustainability um in, in a in a broad sense because for a lot of people i think um would think about sustainability and say oh i recycle my plastics at home right um so we, we were having a bit of this conversation early earlier how then food relates to sustainability more specifically so i hope you guys can pick up from there sure Paul. yeah I, I can start with that yeah the um you know the to me like food is one of the the major connective devices so um people always ask me hey paul you know i care about the environment um, what's something I can do right now that will, that will cause an impact. And, you know, one of the, the things you can do is, is change, you know, the, the, your, your food system, how you interact with that, that food system. Um, you know, as like, just like a little microcosm, it's like, you know, if you care about water, for instance, um, you know, you might be like, well, I take really short showers and you might save maybe 50 gallons of water over a month doing that. But uh, if you eat a single quarter pounder, that's about a thousand gallons of water. <laughs> so it's like um, the amount of water it takes to like create our food, to do all that. And we, in the US, we tend to waste about a third of the food that we create. So if you imagine <laughs> you're walking out of the grocery store and you spend a hundred bucks and you have three big bags of groceries, and when you get to your car, you got to get your keys out. So you put down a bag and then you get your keys out and you open up your car, you load two, but you forget the third and you realize it and you're just like, yeah, and you just drive away. Like that is the equivalent to what we do every day in the US. We throw away a third of the stuff that we buy. So to me, it kind of comes back to like, you know, our resource management, our water management, our just even like who picks the food all those sacrifices that we make, you know, who's getting the food, all of that stuff come in and here we are wasting it. And, and I think that's really hard for people to kind of um, to understand. So I, I think it kind of comes back down to uh, if you start growing your food and you realize how hard it is actually uh, to kind of like manage what, you know, like friends, if you, if you spend your summer growing tomatoes, my bet is that you eat every one of those tomatoes that, that you grow. And if it's got a little spot on it, you eat it anyway. <laughs> so um, 
that 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 sort of mentality of like maybe turning your what you would typically throw away as waste like tori was saying how like you know can can we turn waste back into resources because that's actually the model that nature has provided is you know every breath of carbon dioxide that you kick out of your mouth a plant is like yoink i'll take that and then plants kick out a nasty poisonous gas called oxygen and so we're like yoink we'll take that and then around and around and around we go in this dance nothing is wasted that's purely a thing that we have constructed um, as humans and i think we can we built this system we can totally rethink how it works and so i think sustainability is that mindset it's saying you know if we're if we're wasting human power economic power uh environmental power that that should not happen we should try to redirect those those wastes back into resources if, if we can yeah it's funny talking about tomatoes <clears throat> Because uh, I, I have the luxury of living on a farm right now up in Wisconsin, and um, we operate a CSA where we have about 40 subscribers that, that we create produce boxes for, and, um, and it's, it's about a 40-acre farm, but we just finished or are coming out of tomato season because it's already getting ridiculously cold up here. But at, at our peak, we will harvest hundreds and hundreds of pounds of tomatoes every other day. And it gets to a point where we have so many, we, we can't possibly eat them all. We can't give them away. And, and then that's every, all the artists are horrified when we, when we dump, you know, 50 pounds of tomatoes in the compost pile. But Jay is just, or, or we plant lettuces. And before we can even pick them all, they all go to seed. And the whole patch of lettuce is just like, ah, we wasted it. But, uh, but then, you know, the, the, had guy or he's like you know nothing's nothing's wasted it just goes back into the soil or you know the chickens get into it and you know they help us with our compost and then we gather up the chicken droppings and that goes into the compost and so this is kind of a luxurious opportunity where everything it's, it's like paul says everything kind of has a use um and it's not just it's not just you know to be flavorful for us a tomato it'll go back into the ground and it'll it'll nourish the soil or it'll nourish the the microbiome in there um but you know i understand that's a not a this is not a situation that's <laughs> can be replicated uh in urban areas but it's that's kind of what we're going to try and do with nest is kind of create the opportunity to visualize some of these give and takes and some of these exchanges of, of energy and resources uh, or at least a space to contemplate them right so um, yeah and and i think um, that's a good place to jump in and talk about how you're doing that already for your current project arc um you're, you're working a lot with something called kernza um, as mm -hmm. opposed to wheat which I'll, I'll let you pick up in a moment but i know you were talking about that as this metaphor and example for being rooted in one's community so it's a, a lovely way to think about how planting in root systems and in, in an environmental sense can relate to these broader kind of more expressive ideas so with that i'll let you take it away yeah i don't know if you have one of the do you have one of those graphics of the current the, the roots between a wheat and kernza Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, this is a drawing, but it's, it's pretty significant. And, um, you know, so Kernza, which is on the right of that graphic, they, it's a perennial grain, which means you plant it once and it, it will come back every year, uh, whereas wheat needs to be planted. So um, the, the, the benefits of planting a perennial are just extraordinary. So for one, as you can see, it develops this massive root system that it holds water, it sequesters carbon, it um, creates this really, really rich microbiome in there that, that not only heals the soil, but makes it really rich um, as a growing medium, just lush with teeming. Yeah, these are actual plant structures. And when I saw this, this picture, I was just kind of blown away when you see this massive tangle of roots under there. Um, but then the other thing, because it's a perennial, you don't, you know, one of the problems with farming is that every time you till your soil, you're releasing carbon back out into the atmosphere. So if you don't have to till your soil to plant seeds, you're, you're sequestering that carbon, um, keeping it locked in the ground. So um, perennial grains and prairie grasses are a great carbon sink. Um, but in addition, then this comes back every year, you harvest it and you get a basically a, a wheat type um, 
harvest that can be used for human consumption, whether that's in grains or beer or cereal. And, uh, and then once, once it's harvested, the rest of, of the plant gets, you can either bale it or just let the cows in and, and forage on it. So I don't know, I, I'm kind of using it as a, as a way of, you know, we're really trying to rethink on agriculture on a larger scale because um, the way we've been doing it has been one of the major contributors to climate crisis. So, so this project is just a way to think about that and to, to provide a place where people can kind of ponder this you know, where we're going with agriculture and, and, um, and the idea that like the a root system, the more roots you have within your community, you know, the, the more sort of stable your not only are you, but your community is also benefiting from that. So, you know, creating like this root system is a way to, I don't know, just um, really create a more healthy and stable community around you. Yeah, and, and I think, um, you know, a lot of people, they, they, when they have in their mind art and art materials, they're thinking, you know, canvas and, and oil paints or, or marble, but you think about land art, which goes back to the ancient times, really, you think about like the Nazca lines in Peru, um, it provides you opportunity to think through materials the same way any other artist does and, and to bring that into a larger conversation about how, how we live as humans in the world and in right. root systems, like being in our community. Um, Paul, I don't know if you want to weigh in on any of that yeah, I mean, if, if we're thinking about it, <clears throat> like I try to like cast a big net when it comes to sustainability stuff. So um, some people might not really, you know, have that direct connection with the environment and really, you know, maybe care more about economic incentives. So the, the same, you know, food as your platform can work that way. So if we're thinking about, you know, roots and community and how to improve community, <clears throat> um, you know, where you buy your food can really change that. So if, if you spend your money on like local farmers producing local food, then those dollars tend to like circulate in the economy longer locally. Um, plus a lot of our farming is largely industrial and largely away from wherever you are. You know, so the average miles farm to fork is, it depends on where you are, but it's around 1800 miles. And so even if you're getting organic, let's say salmon in Florida or like farm raised or whatever, it's, um, um, it's going to be shipped at least 5,000 miles, you know, 3,000 miles. And so the carbon impact from the styrofoam and the, maybe it's shipped on a plane and, you know, yet it's wild caught, you know, so like, so I think <laughs> the, the, the more we can, we can think about how, what, what sort of dollars that you, uh, like where you're placing your dollars, because you know, I know that we're in election year and stuff and, and everyone's really interested in like voting, which is great, but we vote every day, honestly. So whenever you buy something in our current system, what you're doing is you're voting for that thing to be there tomorrow. So if you want to see, you know, changes, uh, you want to see a increased local community around food or around whatever you're interested in, if you, if you put your dollars, those votes toward that thing, that thing will be there tomorrow. Um, I guarantee that corporations, companies, whoever are trying to listen to consumers and they listen to consumers via profits. So if there are more profits, they will be there in force tomorrow. If there are less, they will evacuate that space. So I think all of us as consumers of you know, goods and services need to be voting, thinking about voting, not only on an every two or four year cycle, but on an hourly cycle. <clears throat> you know, if you choose to go to a local restaurant versus, you know, something else that changes your community, it allows people to lay down those roots and then, <clears throat> you know, they're more sustainable over something like a pandemic or, you know, any sort of economic in inflections or something. So, you know, thinking about that and then also maybe you approach this, <clears throat> excuse me, from a more of a nutritional standpoint, you know, if you think about how our food is shipped across basically the world you know, fruit is picked not at maximum nutritional yield, but they're largely green or unripe or, or something and then shipped and trying to ripen in transit so that by the time it does make it to, you know, whatever grocery store that you're shopping at, hopefully by then it's maybe somewhat ripe, which is, which is not the way plants are designed to, to be harvested. So what, even though you're eating broccoli, 
if that broccoli is shipped 2000 miles and shipped from train to plane to car to train to plane, you know, like all throughout all those, every, everybody who touches it, it gets damaged. The actual nutritional component of that broccoli that you think you're getting is not what you're actually getting. So not only do does buying like local food improve your community, allow other people to lay down those roots, but it invests you in that community. And, um, and you end up getting a better output, not only, you know, again, from your community, but also for your own personal health. Because now when you snip that broccoli and it comes 30 miles down the road, it only had to go 30 miles. So it can be harvested at nutritional peak, at flavors peak, and then delivered to you. And everybody wins across the way. Again, this is a system that we've built and we can totally change. It just depends on, you know, if you want to invest that that money or that time or or those uh, those thoughts or, or or whatever into into that system, and and we can all benefit. We can all benefit from a more community sourced everything. That's actually why I'm at a community college. Like I love the mission of a community college because like the the idea that like we can teach our community, the community that stays here. So for instance, like in Gainesville, no one goes to to Gainesville, like like let's say as a student to be like, I'm gonna set up shop in Gainesville. I mean, like somebody does, but not everybody. But what's so valuable about HUC is that we can affect our community here because largely the students that you have or the faculty you interact with or the staff or admin or whoever, they live nearby, like they're down the road. So that's so cool. And they've set up shop here. Like they're gonna be here for 30 years. So I, love, I find this to be, yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. and I wanna say, I love that you brought that up because that, that really does bring us back home talking about Ness. Um, and I wanna just bring up like one more thing uh, before we turn over to Kelsey and then Q&A because we actually have quite a few questions in the chat. And I wanna make sure we got time to address them all. But this idea of investing in community is so central for this project. Um, and while people get to watch it, and by the way, for our audience members, the fabrication for both nest sites will occur in the spring, as I mentioned, um, in 2021. So you'll be able to see this growth, see this investment into, you know, literally the spaces that we inhabit at the college. Um, and, and as you get to see that, it reminds us about the wonder and the magic, uh, as Paul, you had mentioned er in our earlier conversations, that you see in the transformation that's inherent in these systems, seed to plant, to something you can eat, like everyone who's following along doing the herb planting, which then you can turn into compost and, and starting all over again. So I wanna leave it open for you guys to say a couple of things about that, and then we'll move on to Kelsey Morgan. Yeah, well, Tori, if you wanna go, yeah, go for it. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I may be a little bit off topic here. <laughs> I got distracted. But just in kind of in closing, what I would just like to say is that, um, I mean, we have a really interesting opportunity here um, to design a, a really non-traditional project that can, um, that can actually be effective uh, within the HCC community. And, um, you know, this is, this is not going to be a sort of top-down design process. We really want to after you guys engage with these talks and listen to Paul and, um, you know, understand your, your campus a little bit more, um, we really want you to be thoughtful and engaged with this process of designing this thing and so that it, this can be a, um, a public space or a project that you really just want to be in or that's, that's constantly interesting to you. Um, and so I think a talk like this really kind of gets you know, we, do, we don't have to talk about art to create a really interesting art piece. We're talking about sustainability and, and agriculture and all of these interesting things that are really personal to all of us because <laughs> we need it to survive. Uh, I suppose we need art to survive too, uh, but that's just a, in a different way. But, um, but I really want you guys to think about this and generate ideas and questions so that we can all together, you know, kind of build something that, um, that'll kind of really energize that space and make it interesting for a while to come. Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, back to kind of maybe what Dr. Barber was talking about with connections. Um, I try to think about what really drives me. And, um, you know, when, when I first started planning things, it's like, it's hard because it's a big learning curve. But I remember I was planting all this, uh, these lettuces and kales and stuff. And, my uh, my nieces before before I had kids would come over and uh, they, they were maybe six or five 
and they would come in and they're not veggie eaters, you know? So, but they would come over and be so excited to like rip a leaf out of the ground and run around and eat it like a lollipop. And then it just really like drove home to me that like they thought it was so crazy that you could eat things out of the dirt, you know, and how far away that we've been removed from our food. And that sort of spurred me on to this idea that like this deep yearning for connection through, to, you know, people like it drove, it got me closer to my, my sister and her, you know, and her daughters. And then also, you know, I grow things with my wife and my kids and then during the like as the seasonal changes happen like right now it's getting a little bit cool i know it's cold where you are tori but <laughs> it's just barely cold here in florida and all of a sudden my wife and i and you know our kids are like excited about leafy greens to come back we're excited uh for like it to be like planting season we're excited for those fresh tomatoes again you know whereas if if you're just if you're not connected to those natural cycles of the planet you it it kind of is a lot like the pandemic you're kind of in this like time soup where you're not sure what time of year it is cuz the same strawberries are there at Publix all year round no matter what and and it like makes you feel so good to kind of like have this um be be more in tune be more of the earth and and uh uh, and see the flowers blooming and the foods come in and out of season. It's just, there's just something there. I think it's so primal and it's something that we're missing because we are removed from those systems. We feel like we're removed and we're not, we're not really like meant to be removed from it. Like we are nature. We're not like above nature. We, we're, we are it. And I think we just need to like bring those connections back home through projects like this to then make people feel that way. It, it's better than social media, right? You know, it's, it's, it's like we're chasing. <laughs> it's, it's the whole reason why I started making earthworks, you know, because, yeah, you know, in urban, especially in urban areas, you dump a pile of clean soil out there and, and it's really about getting everybody out there and getting their hands in the dirt together. Um, and it's, there's something, like you said, so primal, but it, it, it changes the way you feel about things, about, about all things, really. But then, you know, also with the, with the advent of industrialized agriculture, we, we lost agricultural ritual. So it's not just about how our, where our food comes from, but it's also how we relate to each other over systems that are, you know, imperative to our lives, you know. Being up here and working with farm families, um, and of course, you know, there's a massive crisis in agriculture right now where, you know, farmers are being driven out of business and bought up by big ag. But it's, I'm, I'm having in this revelation just working with real farmers out here that has just been so heartwarming. But you know, when you get a project and get, I mean, I know we, it was the intention for this project, we can't really do it quite now, but getting every, people out and, and digging the soil and planting seeds and harvesting and maintaining the garden all together, I mean, that's, that's just as important as the uh, healthy food that you grow, you know. Yeah, and we've been talking a little bit about normally we relate to food and things like a, a grocery store. And, and I want to introduce Kelsey for this next bit um, because I, I, we need to be mindful that not everyone actually has the same kind of access to nutritional, fresh food every day. Um, and this is something that's certainly affecting many people in Hillsborough County and, and quite a few students at our community college. So Kelsey, at this time, I'd like you to go ahead and unmute. Um, Kelsey Morgan is the Food to Finish Food Security Coordinator for Hillsborough Community College. So I'm gonna let her tell you about all the good things she's doing to address food insecurity. Thank you, Amanda. Let me share my screen. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes. Okay, great. So as Amanda said, um, I'm the AmeriCorps VISTA serving as the food security coordinator for HCC's food security and wellness initiative, Food to Finish. Um, food to Finish's mission is to eradicate food insecurity as a barrier to the educational success of students, faculty, and staff. Um, which aligns so perfectly with NET's mission to empower creative solutions for addressing issues of food insecurity, sustainability, and inclusion. Um, so I'm really thankful to be working 
uh, with this project and it's created such a great space to openly discuss issues of food insecurity and adequate nutrition and like Paul said with um, you know adding opportunities to the future. And so Food to Finish aims to be a part of this conversation by presenting the resources that we provide to the HCC community. If I can move to the next slide. Um, so the resources that we have available are food bags um, and these bags uh, have non-perishable items that are listed there, just things that could last someone for a week at a time. Uh, we also provide diapers to help with diaper need, feminine hygiene products to help with period poverty, and dental hygiene and personal hygiene products. Um, and then we have these services on every campus. So starting with the Nest uh, campus sites, Dale Mabry and Ebor. Uh, Dale Mabry has a food distribution site in the library, open during library hours. And we have monthly pop-up pantries where we provide all of our services to the HCC community. And that next pop-up is October 15th. And then Ebor has food distribution sites in YSSB and Ebor. And we also have diapers and feminine hygiene products available for pickup in uh, YCDC. And we also have a pop-up in Ebor next week on Tuesday, October 6th. Uh, from 11 to 1, which is super exciting. And then going to our other campuses, Brandon and South Shore also have food distribution sites in their libraries and monthly pop-up pantries as well. Um, uh, Brandon's is October 22nd and South Shore's is October 15th, I believe, or 8th, sorry. <laughs> And then Plant City also has resources available and all of their food is provided by United Food Bank. And that contact, point of contact is Molly Koffel, which I put her information on the slide. In case anyone here is at any of these campuses, I wanted to provide the resources that we have on each of them. Um, yeah, so all the resources can also be accessed by making an appointment with me. Um, my email is on the slide, but I can also add it to the chat. Our updates, calendar of events, resources, volunteer opportunities are all posted on our Instagram and Facebook, which is just at Food to Finish. We have health and wellness social media campaigns, which include nutrition tips, living on a budget, stretching a dollar, local deals, and tons of other health and wellness topics that we think could really benefit the HCC community, or really anyone who's you know on a budget. And um, you can also view our student intranet page by following Student Life to Food Pantry. But yeah, I please don't hesitate to reach out to me with any requests or questions or concerns. I'm really here to serve the HCC community. And I'm so thankful to be a part of this and to kind of present what Food to Finish is doing this year. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, so this is a good time to note that as part of our, our goal with Ness and meeting our this idea of nourishment, not only will we be growing things in the dirt, uh, but also in the spring when we unveil these projects at Dale Mabry and Ebor, we'll have mobile food pantries or, or groceries on the go through Feeding Tampa Bay and working in conjunction with Kelsey and her office for Food to Finish. So um, trying to make sure that we're really supporting our community and thinking about um, wellness in this really broad sense and who has access to making sure everybody is served. Um, we have, I, I'm so excited, we've got quite a few questions in the chat and our student worker, Mark Miller, has been monitoring those for us. So I'm now going to turn it over to Mark um, for our first question. Yes, yes. Um, we, have a, we have a question from Kenneth. He says, what do you recommend as a source for the seats? Uh, I could take that one. Um, there's a few sources we have for seeds. Um, <clears throat> if you are a community member, if you're here local in Tampa, we do offer free seeds at a seed library. Uh, right now, there are two locations, one at South Shore and one at Ebor. And how a seed library works is you can come in, you can check out free seeds, and the object of the library is you get to go home, you plant those like let's say pumpkins, of course you eat the pumpkin or do whatever you want with it. And then you just simply bring the seeds back to the library from that, from that pumpkin. And then our office, the sustainability office will uh, collect those seeds from you and then we'll redistribute them out to the community through the seed library. So that's one free option. You can find those at the Ebor and South Shore libraries. We have a variety of plants there that work pretty well in Florida. Um, given the pandemic right now, 
I don't think the C libraries are open, but uh, that it will be a resource once you know things get back to back to normalish. Um, <laughs> if you if you don't want to wait, um, I recommend a few places. One place will be um, it's called the company's name is called Baker's Creek, um, and their website is called rareseeds uh, dot dot com. And um, what I really like about them is that they bait their family basically like travels the world finding really rare types of seeds. Um, they have really cool stuff like multicolored corn and purple carrots and uh, you know, like yellow carrots and all sorts of crazy colored tomatoes that get are they're big and small and they taste like this. And there's like three foot long beans that are awesome. Um, and they have a variety of all sorts of stuff. And I look forward to that seed catalog every year. <laughs> it sounds kind of silly, but when it comes in the mail, it's like, it's like Christmas for me and I get to thumb through it and then they take beautiful pictures. So um, that, that's a really good one. If you're interested in straight up farming type seeds, uh, Johnny's is another good place for finding a lot of uh, like hybrid seeds that will produce, that might be uh, really heat or drought tolerant or cold tolerant. Whereas the, uh, the rareseeds.com are heirlooms. And so that means you can save them year after year after year and they will keep basically uh, the same traits as the parent. Um, yeah, and so I, I recommend any one of those three for being a good one. And I strongly recommend that our seed libraries, they're really active. We get a lot of participation there and we are seeing uh, seeds coming back that will then, we will distribute them back to the community. So they're actually seeds that do well enough in our community that produce food, that then the seeds come back to produce food and round and round and round we go. So just super cool. Um, yeah. Great, thank you, Paul. We have another question. Go yes, Jane Alasco says, Paul, this may be a silly question, but is it okay to just bury food scraps like banana peels, skin of vegetables and fruits, coffee grinds around the bottom of the plants, of the plants and trees without mixing them with, uh, with mulch? Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Judy. You know there's no silly questions, so um, <laughs> um, <laughs> she knows better. The, <laughs> um, yeah, like you can definitely do that. To me, it, it's better to throw the banana peel into the bushes than to wrap it in plastic and send it to the landfill. Um, that, but that's me. That's, now, could you potentially attract ants or maybe rodents or something? Yeah. So that, that could be a problem. Now, if it's just like one or two banana peels, that's probably fine. Now, if you're dumping 50 pounds of banana peels behind the hedge, your neighbors might not like that very much. The, what the mulch does is it sort of insulates the food waste from flies, from rodents, from all those things. And, and you, I think of it kind of like you're making a lasagna. So you're starting off with a nice layer of noodles, right? We'll call that the mulch. And then you drop your, your food waste on top. And then you make a nice layer of noodles again, and you make yourself a nice compost lasagna. And then the magic ingredient in there is water. So you add some water, and then you can actually create this like beautiful mix of lasagna. And you know maybe that's a whole other talk that we do later for like how to do do composting. Yeah. But it's not hard. I mean, like you're not going to turn it back into a banana. It will eventually rot. So yeah. you know, I, I'd say don't just start trying stuff and and see what works. Like we shouldn't be afraid of. Of composting. Yeah, and and that it's it's a bit there's there's a beauty to composting about how all of these things break down. It's it's it goes beyond just mixing them together, but really then how all of that kind of breaks down and creates you know the rich soil that plants love to grow in. Um, but that is that's a much. I mean, we could do a whole one of these just on composting. So. It seems like we people should. are super curious. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> give people what they want, right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So I saw that um, someone posted a link about perfectly imperfect produce, and I think that relates back to the idea of, you know, what we might throw away or, you know, what actually ends up to our grocery store. So thank you for that, that comment. And then we have our next question. So go ahead, Mark, when you're ready. Yes, yes Juliana says, what fruits and vegetables will you suggest to start planting for this upcoming season? I feel like cold normally ruins my herbs. Good question. Or do you want to try or do you want, I can do it, either one. Well, I mean, the, when I did my gardening projects down there, the fall, I mean, the 
heading into this time in Florida is like the best time to start planting. I mean, I, I would do any kind of leafy greens, kales and spinaches. And um, I did a lot of bok choy, red bok choy and green bok choy and uh, tot soy. Um, all these things just flourished in November, December, January. Um, grew a lot of snap peas as well. And those are really fun to, to grow in the colder. Um, it's, you know, Florida is so great. You can grow year round, but the winter time is, it's, you can just about grow anything you want. Uh, some of the warmer weather, I mean, you don't probably don't want to grow okra in the, in the winter, but um, definitely leafy greens. Uh, I grew, I love root vegetables like beets. Beets are one of my favorite things to grow. So uh, I would always grow beets in the winter, things like that. That's what, that's what I would suggest. Paul? Um, yeah, I, I always try to grow things that I, um, well, number one, that I'll eat. <laughs> so, you know, so that's one thing. I know that I grow okra every summer, but to be honest, I eat about like five pieces of okra and then I'm like, mm, you know, <laughs> so, so like I do okra mostly for the flowers. I just think they're really pretty. Yeah. And then I do, um, uh, a ton of leafy greens this this time of year and so yeah broccoli is one of my favorite because when you snap uh, a piece of broccoli off that you grew and you eat it like basically from the plant into your mouth in less than a second i i bet that's going to leave an impression like it it's sweet it's crisp um it has the flat you can eat the flowers um they have a nutty sweet flavor because there's a bit of nectar in there and a bit of pollen um and what, what I find that if you go onto that website, the Rare Seeds website, um, you can actually find a variety of like culturally significant foods that aren't really significant to maybe the U.S., you know, like kind of standard palate, whatever. Um, so you can find all sorts of different beans that have different textures and flavors. Um, yeah, but I think every, all the brassicas, so, you know, all your, your kales and cabbages and broccolis and uh, Brussels sprouts, they're all an excellent choice right now. All your lettuces are great. Even you can get away with tomatoes in the winter. That's what makes Florida's winter is everyone else's summer, you yeah. know, basically. So arugula is another I'd say good one. Arugula, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you just oh, you, you pick it and eat it when you walk by, and it's just that blast of pepper is amazing. Yeah, well, and I think for super hungry. for kids. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if you're if you have kids, try to get something that that will grow quickly that they can play with that then they can eat and they'll like so you know I, I find that um the sugar snaps are an excellent choice for kids because they're pretty prolific they they tend to like really colder weather so you, i tend to wait a little bit more but i just plant them all year until they start growing um and then when your kids walk around the garden to, to get them outside to get them active and eating fresh food uh that's just an, an awesome awesome choice so yeah. Thank you. And, and I saw Dr. Uh, Chris Bolitsky put in a, a central planting calendar, so you guys can go check that out um, while we have our next question. Yes, Giselle says, Paul, from what I've heard from my sister about your environmental science class is that reducing is better than recycling. Is there any tips you can give on being reduced in your ways and being more conscious of it? Ah, great question. Yeah, so I tend to think that recycling um, is great -ish. okay so it depends on what you're recycling but um to be a good environmental warrior we have to think beyond recycling recycling is very similar to throwing things into the landfill type trash we want to try to avoid doing that if possible so um yeah as far as the uh um how we should be thinking about about dealing with waste we should be trying first to just reduce our impact overall so if you can make that iPhone last another year, that's what you should try to do. If you if you can buy a renewable water bottle versus like 10 disposable water bottles, even though you're recycling the, the plastic, we should try to do that that thing. So yeah, on the hierarchy of, of the things we should do, don't think that recycling is the thing that's making you an environmental warrior out there. It's, it's largely a last ditch effort to capture um, a bit of material. And to be frank right now, our recycling has a lot of problems going on. And that's probably another talk similar to composting. Mm -hmm. It's nuanced and, and, and difficult. But yeah, thanks for the question. Reducing is what we should really be trying to do. Um, 
first, first and foremost. So source reduction is what it is. Um, we are at time, but I think maybe we can do quick responses to some of these six questions. So go ahead, Mark, with the next one. You guys don't mind hanging out. Yes, Aurora says, what are some examples of perennial grains? Perennial grains, geez, that is a good question. <laughs> I'm not sure. There aren't that many of them. Um, when you go into big agriculture, like for example, in Wisconsin, it, most of the crops here are corn and soybeans. And very little of all of that corn is edible. It doesn't get used for human consumption. Most of it goes to either the production of ethanol or it goes to um, feeding livestock. So you'll drive through Wisconsin and it is just cornfield after cornfield after cornfield and none of it is for us to eat. Um, but the, all of those crops get, get planted and harvested every year. So the, the issue with perennial grains is what makes them so great because of their root structure is in the beginning parts of their lives, all the energy of just say Kernza, for example, it goes into the root system. And so not as much energy is going into the actual edible part of the plant. Like, so when we, when you grow wheat, you plant the seeds and it immediately starts putting energy into the wheat berries that, you know, we harvest and make bread. The problem for farmers um, with perennial grains is that you know, the economic systems that farmers face in general are not very balanced and they're certainly not fair to the farmers. So when they, when they think about the economics of growing crops, um, if they have the option to grow a crop like wheat that is going to, even though it's, it may be more work, it's gonna create a much higher amount of wheat than planting Kernza, which is gonna maybe only give them 20 or 30% of that harvest. I mean, for them, that's, that's a no brainer. It's like, I can't plant a perennial grain because it takes too long for me to make any money off it. Um, so there aren't a lot of perennial grains that are being used out there. And Paul, if you, if you know of any, you can jump in, but um, you know, the, and, and Kernza is actually just based off a of prairie, a, a perennial wheatgrass, you know, there are these prairie grasses, um, which have been displaced by huge mono, uh, monoculture, Agriculture, so corn, soybeans, wheat, all of these things now get planted every year um, just because they've been, they've been bred to be more productive. Um, so yeah, it's a difficult choice for a, for, for a farmer to, to do that. And I don't think many farmers are actually doing perennial grains. I know in my project, we're gonna be planting um, silphium, which is a perennial sunflower and that you, you harvest that for the oil and the sunflower. So you basically get sun, sunflower oil out of that. Um, and it's a native to this region and, and it's also a perennial, but I don't know of too many that are actually in circulation. I think they're trying, there's a perennial wild rice, um, but that requires um, much wetter um, land to, to be grown on. And um, they might be doing perennial rice in some places in Asia to that for sure. It's okay. Um, we got a couple of questions about farm stands, so I want to jump to those. Go ahead, Mark. Yes. Do you recommend any farm stands markets that offer a good amount of local produce? Yeah, I know um, the St. Pete Saturday or yeah, the Saturday morning market. Yeah, the, um, they actually do a pretty good job. Um, you know, Gordon Farms there is a local farm. There's Little Pond. There's a um, a farm actually going down in, in downtown Tampa right now um, called Meacham Farm. And you can, uh, that they were just out there planting things in the ground last time that I was out there. So that's a brand new farm coming into the fray. Um, I would try to look up um, you know, some local farms online, wherever you are, if you're in Tampa, there's a few. We're actually pretty lucky in Florida that, you know, you know, just not far away, an hour at, at even at most, Plant City area is chock full of farms. So um, I recommend if you're going to go, you know, like maybe join the CSA, which is community supported agriculture, there's lots of models out there for that. If you're interested in eating uh, meat that is to do that. Um, maybe you don't want to buy like a 400 pound pig 
that's a lot of pork. Um, <laughs> that, that's, you know, so so what, what you can do is team up, and I've done this. Um, you know, you can team up with maybe uh, let's say like four other people, right? And then you each buy a quarter of that of that pig. And then what ends up happening is that local hog farmer actually makes more money selling direct to the, to the consumer than they do selling it at like wholesale rate to then get passed all around to eventually come back to, um, you know, big box stores or something. So everybody actually wins. You pay less than you do buying at Publix and you get a better quality, quality meat that is, is actually like raised in a humane way that, uh, that you wouldn't be sad to look at. <laughs> So, you know, um, so I think we're lucky in Florida, honestly, that we are really close to like blueberry fields and strawberries and, and lots of other, other crops that, um, that you can get, get fresh and relatively local almost yeah. all year. Yeah, I think that was echoed by another user, Danny, about farms close to Tampa we could visit. Um, and, and other people were chiming into that. Giselle said there's a local farm in Bears. Um, Timothy Bennett said Sweetwater Organic Community Farm in Carrollwood is also a really nice farm to tour. Learning Gate Community School, a non-for-profit uh, K through eight, has an amazing farm program. Um, but you know, right now in, in COVID era, make sure you're checking uh, mm -hmm. what you can and can't visit. Um, we'll take one last question coming from Travis Meeks, if you want to go ahead and read that, Mark, real quick. Yes, our leaves are a substitute for mulching compost. Yeah, um, you know, that's it. We'll be back with a second. Um, you basically want two things in your compost. You want some brown stuff and green stuff. and. The browns are typically designated um, dried carbon. So that's leaves, that's mulch, uh, you know, that's, that's like brown leaves. Um, you know, even things like newspaper or paper, sawdust, that, that type of stuff. If you're using sawdust, try to make sure it's non-pressure treated. Um, and then your greens are more wet stuff. So I think of it kind of like your food waste, maybe manures, um, things like that. And then, you know, there's different ratios depending on what type of greens you're adding to what type of browns. But my suggestion is just to start playing, you know? So if you add a bunch of leaves, throw some food waste on top and put some leaves back on top and make sure there's some water in there and it'll break down, you know, one way or another. And what's so cool is it'll actually really start heating up. You're basically making a, a fire that burns at about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So. Um, and we'll keep that temperature up for a, a couple of weeks, actually, and we'll kill all the bad, the bad stuff, you know, the bad guy bacteria. And then we'll actually accumulate all the good guy bacteria. And that's the stuff you want to put into your gardens. So it makes it makes it safe. But yeah, leaves can be used as an alternative to mulch. So you can basically rake up your leaves in the fall like it is right now. But you can compost all that stuff and then use them as um, uh, compost in your in your fall garden. Well, thank you so much. Um, and I know we've gone a bit over, but you can see how everyone is so um, excited and, and our speakers, Paul and Tori, being so passionate. Uh, I want to say a few things and then let you guys go. We're so glad that everyone was here and able to join us for our second Nest event. The next one will be Thursday, October 15th, another live workshop with Tori Tapp from 1230 to 145, talking more about um, public spaces and how those are designed and allowing you to follow along and, and imagine your own public art design yourself. So we hope you come back uh, and see that. We'll put into the chat section a link where you can register for all our future events for NEST. Um, and as a reminder, all of these fall virtual events are in part created to allow community feedback. As you heard from Tori, we, we want you to give us your input so that he can be inspired by it and really address your needs. So we'll also put into the chat another link to the Nest survey, which you can take on your own time. It's very, very simple. And, and this will inspire and inform the designs at both Dale Mavery and Ebor. So, Thank you guys so much, Tori, Paul, also Dr. Clark, Kelsey, for your time, and everyone for being here. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I enjoyed yeah, thanks, it. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Paul, Amanda. Yeah, thank you, Tori. Oh, cool. Um, if you guys want to hang out and to grab those links in the chat, we're going to replay the slideshow so you can see a little bit more of Tori's past work. Um, again, 
stay safe, everyone. Be well. And hopefully we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye.